house. See, I would question whether they were ever saved to begin with if they continue these things, right? And some of them even end up smack dab as, as ministers of churches. And I've heard stories, abundant stories of this myself. But then, of course, what did she say? I know people get saved and still continue. So in one breath, they're saying, well, maybe they were never saved. In the other breath, I can't really judge. Who am I? I'm just a filthy sinner. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. My cloak of righteousness is the same as theirs. It's nothing I do. So the person continues in that activity, waiting for God to affect some kind of repentance in them, right? Like many of the pastors say, that offer the counseling to these type of things I've seen on the websites. God affects repentance. In other words, God has to bring about the repentance. It's not a personal choice of that person turning from that kind of sin. So this person, he says, it works exclusively with this type of abuse and with the victims. And as the mandate states, you have, to, you have to report some of these cases. Well, yeah, for sure. Or you'll go to jail yourself if it gets found out. See, the sin has to, t has to stop. They say, surely it has to stop, but it never does. Because like I said, I know people that are saved. And they continue in this heinous activity. So like I said, notice that these so-called counselors, they cover themselves in both directions. The person doing these heinous acts, they may not be saved. I used to hear this all the time when I was still in the churches years ago. But then they turn around and they say, well, how am I to judge? It's Christ forgives any sin. Well, that's true enough. Christ can forgive any sin, but not while a person is in the very act of that sin. Was the woman caught in adultery in the very act of adultery? No, it was go and sin no more. See, they never see that part. See, every explanation I read from these people uses the same cop-out. They cast doubt on the person's salvation and then assure it in the next breath. Like I said, one pastor I read, he speaks sternly about these horrible sins, and he, gives, he even gives warnings in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. But then he still covers himself by saying sins, things like, well, we can never really know if a person's reprobate or going past the no, point of no return. We can't. When they commit unnatural acts, Paul says they're reprobate in Romans chapter 1. So in other words, the guy's saying the same old cop-out that, well, he still could be a work in progress, so we dare not interfere with what God's doing until he affects repentance in that person. So the abuse continues. The victim is trapped in it because they never seem to help the victims. All they do is blame the victims if they try to escape from these things and go to a, play, a safe haven where they can escape all this. Then they get the blame. So pray for them in the meantime, right, while they're committing these horrible acts. See, they may indeed just claiming to be a Christian, but they also may indeed really be one, just like that other counselor said I read to you. That was typical in the answers that we received. They're just struggling with their addictions, like everyone. Your addiction may not be this horrible act. Well, maybe just, uh, you know, you tell lies or you, you go out and get drunk every once in a while or you look at a little bit of pornography on the, web, on the Internet. What's the difference? See, that's the way they look at these things. These persons need help. They need to enter some 12-step program so they can learn to manage their addictions. Eventually, they might then overcome. But yet, nobody ever seems to overcome. Nothing is said about these things disqualifying a person from the kingdom, nothing about departing from iniquity, coming clean with God in repentance, and certainly nothing about purging the filth from among you, lest the whole body is infected by it and ruined because of all the gossip and dissensions and slander that goes on because of these things. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 about the man caught in the act of adultery with his father's wife, he says, your glorifying, glorifying is no, not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? It's going to affect everyone? Therefore, purge the old leaven that you may be a new lump, 
He told the people not to even eat with such a person that calls himself a brother, who commits such sins as this. And that was a sin of adultery. That's not against the law. This sin we're talking about is not only heinous and horrible, it's a violation of civil law. These people are criminals. They commit sins unto death, and they say, well, pray for them. John said in 1 John 5, don't pray for them. It's useless to pray for them. They don't need counseling. They need to repent. They need to be, be confronted in their sins, given a chance to come clean, to make amends, go to jail in this case we're talking about. And if they persist with more excuses, then expel them from the body until they make amends, till they do repent. That's why he said, hand them over to Satan. That's what he's talking about in that 1 Corinthians 5. I know your pastor said, well, the person was saved that his spirit may be saved in the day. No, it says, may yet be saved in the day of the Lord, in verse 5. May yet be saved. He didn't imply that that person was on safe ground, because he turned right around in the next chapter and says, people that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what more proof do we need if a person is reprobate than that, than unnatural acts as these, like he talks about in Romans 1, 24 through 27 exchanging the, the, the use of the man and the man and the woman and the woman and that, that heinous stuff. What more proof do we need of reprobation? That the tree is rotten and the fruit is rotten and the people are blinded and deceived. So either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, cast it in the fire. Lay the axe to the root. That's what the preacher needs to be preaching on Sunday morning. Not vicious and mean and vindictive like the old puritanical nonsense. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Word of God. What more counseling do we need than Ezekiel says, Cast away all of your transgressions which you have committed and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit for why should you die in your sins? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. What's wrong with that? Well, it doesn't fit into your theology of Jesus doing it all, right? Of receive and repeat the magic words. Keep everybody like safe and feeling good. See, the great delusion here is in what they preach, but is in essence what they counsel to the people under, these, under this mess. But they can't see it because they love to have it so. As the prophet said, you love to have it so. Peace, peace when there is no peace. See, as long as everybody's saved in sin, or saved in the very act of sin, there is no imperative to turn from that sin anytime soon. So they get harder and harder in that sin. Sin hardens. Look at Esau, hardened beyond repentance. Even though when finally he sought it with bitter tears, it was not there anymore. The Spirit of God will not linger forever when you grieve and grieve and grieve. So that's what happens to these people that go reprobate. They harden their hearts beyond conviction of the Spirit, and they continue this string of abuse on others, and victim after victim falls prey to them. And the preachers just stand up there and tell their silly stories on Sunday morning. It's a travesty, folks. That's why your churches are full of pure filth. Pure filth. People that cover up their sins with this sin-confessed relationship, or if I say I have no sin, I'm a liar, all that nonsense. And they supposedly have Jesus, and the preacher's telling them that Jesus can do anything, and the power of God's going to get you a job and get you a new car, and, but that house you want and the spouse, the right spouse to marry, but he can't help you overcome your lust. Your addiction to pornography, your addiction to alcohol and the rest of it, and drugs. What kind of a deliverance is that? If grace is the power to overcome ungodliness and worldly lusts, and live soberly, righteously in this present age, then what have you received? You've received nothing. Nothing. So why would anybody fear the warnings in Scripture? The pastor keeps explaining them away, just like that one pastor I said that spoke severely against these things, or at the same time, he said the people in Hebrews chapter 6, well, they, they were just claiming to be Christians. What, they were partakers of the Holy Spirit? And they're claiming to be Christians. See what I mean? Their theology won't allow them to show that these people were in dire circumstance. They, they were getting into a place where repentance would be impossible to them because they've continually sinned 
and trampled the blood and insulted the spirit of grace one too many times. Just making excuses about sin natures and inability and all that. Look at the count. What did the counselor say? Back to the 